All right, good afternoon, everybody. We're about to start. Um, I am thrilled to see so many people here. Just don't tell the fire marshals. <laughs> but no, this is just terrific, and I'm not surprised at all. Um, for those of you who don't know me, or those of you who are Zooming in, or who will watch this in archive, I'm Michael Scharf. I'm the co-dean of the law school. I've had this position for 10 years. And I think in our 10 years, we've had some amazing speakers here, but maybe none so amazing as today's speaker. This is going to be a fantastic event. So today, I'm going to be presenting you Una Hathaway, professor at Yale Law School, who's also been an advisor to the chief counsel of the Department of Defense. And she is widely acclaimed as the star of her generation in international law. Um, she is, I think, the most insightful scholar that I know, and she is going to share some of her insights with you about international law and the year that has changed since the Ukraine invasion. And it gives me chills to think that we got her on this day because it was exactly a year ago tonight that some of us who were staying up late or who woke up in the morning heard about the massive invasion of Russia of Ukraine. And it changed everything. I got a call from Paul Williams, who co-directs the Public International Law and Policy Group with me. And he said the next day, Michael, for the next 10 years, we're going to be working on Ukraine stuff. And here at the law school, we've also been doing a lot for Ukraine. Last fall, the Journal of International Law and the Cox Center co-sponsored a conference called International Law and the New Cold War. And I just saw the, the latest proofs of the journal issue that is coming out. It's going to be fantastic. Um, and that'll be out in a couple of months. And that will be uh, distributed to all the professors of international law um, and will make a big impact. Uh, we also had our Talking Foreign Policy radio show on that topic. And we are continuing to do a lot of work for the Ukraine government, um, the prosecutor general, and NGOs that are working in this area. But I cannot wait to hear what Una Hathaway has to share with us. And we have something special for her as well. I, I should mention that this is the Order of the Coif Distinguished Lecture. And in order to get that, you have to um, apply to the Order of the Coif. And dozens of schools applied. But Dean Cover wrote a very compelling application. And only three schools were selected. And we were one of them, which is fantastic. Um, and it's also, yes, we can clap for that. And, and it's also a testament to our international law program. We are celebrating the 30th anniversary of the $4 million endowment that we got. And this is a program that uh, has done all kinds of things, including um, received a Nobel Peace Prize nomination for the student work in war crimes prosecutions. Um, and Una started her morning today at 8, meeting with our Yemen Accountability Project students, who may one day also engender a Nobel Peace Prize nomination for what they're working on. But without further ado, Una, can I have you come up so that I can present this? This is something to commemorate your visit with us. It says, Una A. Hathaway, Distinguished Order of the Coif Lecture, A Year That Changed the World, The War in Ukraine and How It Shaped the International Legal Order at Case Western Reserve University School of Law, February 23rd, 2023. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you and, and so you're going to be speaking, what, in like 35, 40 minutes? Exactly. Q &A? Exactly. Yes. So I look forward to all of your questions. So you all have microphones for the Q&A to start with. Yes. OK, we're all set. Hey, great. Fantastic. It's so nice to see you all. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Michael, for that kind of warm welcome and for, and for having me here, for the invitation to join you all uh, to talk about the war in Ukraine and the events that have unfolded over the last year. Um, what I'm going to try to do today Yes, my. <laughs> we had it working a second ago. Oh, maybe I have to turn it back on again.
was working just a minute ago. Ah, there we go. Okay, I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way. All right, awesome. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to do today um, uh, is talk just a little bit of a reminder of kind of what happened a year ago. And those of you who are standing in the back, there are a couple of seats up here, and there's one here and there's two here, so feel free to come so you don't have to stand. Um, uh, so my first plan is to uh, talk about the, you know, just remind you of the events that initially unfolded about a year ago, the war uh, began February 24th, uh, 2022. Uh, then I want to talk a bit about how has international law responded? Um, you know, what is the role of international law in the response to the war? Uh, so my main field is international law. Uh, and it may not be totally obvious from the news exactly how international law is playing a role here. So I want to talk through some of the ways in which international law has shaped the global response to the war. Um, then I want to talk about some of the challenges that are revealed by the war um, for the global order, for international law more generally. Uh, and then I want to talk about the impact on the global order so far. Uh, the so far being necessary because here we are just a year in. Uh, and, uh, you know, we don't know what's going to unfold over the next coming weeks, months, um, and unfortunately probably years. Okay, so that's the plan. Oh, sorry. Go back here. All right, so first, um, the war began on February 24th, 2022. This is an image that sort of shows the initial attack that um, took place and kind of the back and forth of the, the seizure of territory. Putin thought that he was going to uh, invade and that he was going to take Kiev within three days. Uh, he obviously didn't succeed at that. Um, there was an initial uh, wave in from the south, uh, coming up from Crimea, which is that sort of uh, peninsula there. That had been seized by Russia, you may remember, back in 2014, in a kind of bloodless uh, conquest of territory. So there were troops there that moved up from the south. Troops were also coming in from the east, which has been, there's been sort of a fair bit of succession of fighting in the east already, and, and there's a lot of Russian stations kind of east, uh, uh, coming into eastern part of Ukraine, and they come from Belarus in the north, but uh, the pulse pretty quickly, as you can see, is uh, coming down. There was an initial grab of uh, territory, and then a kind of push back, which has been remarkably successful, the, the Ukrainian defense, and the ability to push back on some of those initial gains from Russia. And of course, Ukraine succeeded in preventing uh, uh, Russia ever from reaching Kyiv, which was its initial goal. OK, so that was the kind of beginning of the war. Um, and that, was, that war was a kind of fundamental affront and clear violation of one of the key foundational principles of international law. That is Article 2.4 of the United Nations Charter. Um, so this is the, the, the language of the charter, which prohibits, effectively prohibits states from using force against one another. Um, this is not just one role of the system, I want to argue, but it is kind of the fundamental underlying rule of the international legal order. And that Russia invading uh, Ukraine in the way that it has and starting the largest land war in Europe since the Second World War um, has really put not just this principle at risk, but by putting this principle at risk, it's put the whole global order at risk along with it. Um, and so the response of the, of the globe is, is really crucial. Uh, now, Putin offered some reasons uh, when he first uh, waged the war. He, he offered some arguments for why he was waging the war. Um, and I'll preface it by saying none of these are actually good legal arguments. Right? These are all pretty baseless legal arguments. Right? So, First, that NATO was somehow posed some security threat to Russia. There was concern that Ukraine had shown some interest in potentially joining the EU and eventually NATO. Um, and there was sort of some talks beginning, but that was quite the distance. And as to whether it would have ever happened, it's hard to know. In fact, what he succeeded in doing instead of making it much more likely that Ukraine will be admitted to NATO by, by invading and, of course, other countries have since, uh, who have sort of stayed outside of NATO, have since changed their minds and applied for membership. Um, so that was his, his one of the reasons that he gave. Not a legal reason uh, for, for using military force against your neighbor, but, but a reason that he provided. He made basic claims of genocide. Um, and this is going to become important in a moment. Um, talk about what, how Ukraine responded to these baseless claims of genocide. But the claim was that there was genocide being committed in eastern Ukraine and that 
there had to be that uh, by Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, and that Russia had to kind of come in and defend uh, people from this genocide. Also claims of collective self-defense of these independent republics. So Russia had recognized these independent republics um, and sort of instilled some uh, Russian state of leaders in the kind of eastern regions of Ukraine. Um, in international law, you can't do that. Um, you can't sort of declare independent regions on your own. They have, there's a whole process of international recognition, which generally requires that a state, that if a portion of a state is going to secede from the tariff from the state that it was originally part of, that that's in compliance with domestic law, which of course this wasn't in compliance with Ukrainian law. Um, and then he was also making arguments about self-defense. So none of these, none of these sort of really good legal arguments, but he's sort of trying to speak interestingly, trying to speak in the register of international law, which is kind of a curious thing. Um, and we're going to come back to some of these arguments. Okay. Now, the initial response from many people, and I don't know if you remember this, Michael, but initially a lot of people were sort of saying, like, this is it. This is the end of the global order. I mean, there was so commentators, these are just a couple of examples, but even, you know, the Ukrainians were saying, like, if you don't, if we don't survive, like, this is the end of the international order. And in fact, you know, we're starting to see the collapse of the international order. And, you know, at first it sort of seemed that way, frankly. You know, you've got a nuclear armed state that is a member, of, a permanent five member of the Security Council, so it can prevent the UN from responding to the Security Council, uh, invading its much uh, smaller uh, and less well provisioned neighbor. Um, you know, that does seem like the end of the post war legal order um, as we knew it. Um, but uh, as we're going to see, the response proved a lot more robust than Putin was expecting. Um, and I want to argue that actually what we're seeing in this response is a possibility that the threat that was originally kind of the most grave threat to the international legal order might actually prove to help strengthen and resuscitate it. So my remarks today are based at, in part on some thinking work that I did um, for a book that I wrote that, um, with my colleague Scott Shapiro that was published about five years ago um, called The Internationalists. And in that, what we try to do is show that there's a kind of arc of international law. Um, that international law used to rest on the idea that states could wage war. And that war was legal and legitimate. And in fact, that was a main way in which states legitimately resolved their disputes with one another. And that that transformed first uh, in the Kelly Grand Pact in 1928, which if you've ever heard of it, mostly it's probably on your sort of AP history exam or the history exam, sort of, you know, to say how ridiculous international law is. Part of this book is trying to say it's not so ridiculous after all. It actually made some important changes in the world. And then that was reaffirmed in the 1945 uh, United Nations Charter, which again puts that prohibition on war right at the center of the charter, in Article 24, the beginning, and kind of build a kind of organizational structure around it. Um, so Putin was sort of acting as if he's back in the kind of old world order era and not in the modern era in which we face. Now, the question that the war kind of puts to us is, is that global order, is this transformation, is the global order that was put in 1945 still going to survive, is going to survive this, this war? Um, and what I want to argue here is it's not just the violation that matters, but how states respond, right? It's not just the violation of international law, but it's the response to the law. And that's true generally of law, if you think about it. You know, it's not, we don't say that, you know, my laptop was stolen and therefore, like, let's give up on the laws of theft, right? I mean, we say, you know, we, we file a police report, we hope the police will try and do it again, and if they ever do, the person's going to be thrown in jail, right? There's, there's consequences for violating law. So law being effective doesn't mean that it's not ever, it, that it's not ever violated. It just means that um, there, are, there are consequences for the action of violating the law. So let's see what the consequences were. So that's where international law comes in. International law is part of what helped structure um, and encourage and strengthen the response of states to this war, this illegal war. So I'm going to talk first about how it helped uh, uh, condition the, the condemnation of the war. So I mentioned that Russia is a member of the permanent five members of the Security Council who can veto any action by the United Nations Security Council. And initially people thought, well, that just means the UN's not going to be able to do anything. Right? But 
What was really interesting is while there was an initial effort to condemn the war in the Security Council, when that failed, um, it was referred to uh, the General Assembly under what's called the Uniting for Peace Resolution. And the Uniting for Peace Resolution is a resolution that was put in place uh, uh, many decades ago, kind of had fallen into disuse. It basically says when a member of the Security Council exercises a veto in a matter of international peace and security, it can be referred to the General Assembly. So that's what happened here. It was referred to the General Assembly. And the General Assembly voted 141 states uh, in favor of a resolution condemning the war. Uh, only five states voted against. One of them was Russia. So it was a, it was a, it was a pretty lopsided vote. And in that vote, among other things, they clearly condemn the aggression by the Russian uh, Federation against Ukraine in violation of Article 2.4 of the Charter, the very underlying language there. Um, so calling out the Russian violation is not just wrong, it's not just bad, it's not just bad public policy, but it's clearly illegal and a violation of the Charter. And remember, of course, the General Assembly is created by that very same Charter, and the purpose of the United Nations is to maintain international peace and security. Um, so this was a first step, and I think it was an important step to conditioning everything that kind of followed. This, this very broad-based, widespread condemnation of the war, I think, let everyone, put everyone on notice that this was considered to be an illegal war. Um, there were a number of other fora, international legal fora, that also got into the act. So I mentioned before that Putin had made these sort of baseless claims uh, that there was genocide taking place in eastern Ukraine. And so Ukraine, in a very clever legal move, um, took advantage of the fact that there's a dispute resolution mechanism within the Genocide Convention that says that there's disputes between states that are party to the convention, that they can seek an opinion in the, in the uh, International Court of Justice. And both Ukraine and Russia are party to the Genocide Convention, and so that gave uh, Ukraine access to the International Court of Justice. And so they filed um, a case in the International Court of Justice asking for provisional measures and essentially saying, they say we're committing genocide. Um, we want you to assess whether, in fact, that's true and whether that's a legitimate basis for, um, for evading us. Uh, and of course, the International Court of Justice, moving in record time, I will say. Like, this is not an institution known for moving super quickly. I mean, you've, you've worked with them. I mean, they tend to move very slowly, but within a few weeks. So that the um, application was filed amazingly, I think three days after the war started. And then uh, the decision came down on provisional measures within about three weeks saying that clearly, no, this was a baseless argument, um, and voting that the Russian Federation shall immediately suspend the military operation that it commenced on 21st February 2024 in the territory of Ukraine, among other things. So this shut down one of the legal claims um, that Ukraine was trying to, that Russia was trying to make um, for the legal basis of the war, and showing and exposing that this was clearly illegal and not, and not a legitimate basis for invading Ukraine. Okay, so that's condemning. Um, and there were other condemnations, but, but we'll, we'll, for the interest of time, we'll, we'll stop there. The second thing I'm going to talk about is what I call outcasting. Um, now, this term comes from some work that I've done, again, with my colleague Scott Shapiro, on how is international law enforced. And we uh, wrote this very long law review article, as you all know, law review articles are in general very long. Uh, this is no exception to that rule. Um, taking on this question of whether international law is actually enforced and whether, um, whether the distinctive way in which international law is enforced is, in fact, enforcement of law. And we try to argue that there's, ah, the virtual audience needs to hear me better. OK, so I guess I need to, is this on? OK, all right, OK. Now, hopefully they'll be able to hear me better now. Um, what we were trying to do in this article was to say that, um, that inter some people think that international law is not actually enforced because it's not enforced in exactly the same way that domestic law is enforced. Right? You don't have international law police. Um, and so since you don't have international police, some people say, well, that means that you know, international law is not really enforced. And what we tried to argue in this article is that actually that misunderstands how international law is enforced, that one of the key ways in which international law is enforced is through what we call outcasting, 
which is that when a state violates international law, it can lose the benefits of being a member of the international community and the benefits of international cooperation. So just to give an example, um, if a state puts in place an illegal tariff that's found to be illegal by, uh, the, by the WTO, it allows the state that was harmed to put in place a countermeasure. What is a countermeasure? A countermeasure is basically the right to put in place an illegal tariff in response, a, a tariff that otherwise would have been illegal in response. So you get to sort of act back in a way that otherwise would have been illegal, so depriving the state that engaged in a violation of international law the benefits of the protection of international law that they would otherwise enjoy. So that's a basic idea. Um, and one of the key ways in which, um, in which these, uh, these outcasting sanctions um, take place is through sanctions, economic sanctions. It's one of the kind of big examples of, of outcasting. And this is uh, just one chart uh, that shows, um, that was put together by the Peterson Institute for International Economics that shows some of the sanctions that have been put in place uh, against Russia since the war um, began uh, against Ukraine. And what we see is that there's a really unprecedented global response. And these are voluntary sanctions, so this is distinctive from other instances where there have been Security Council imposed sanctions. So again, because Russia is a member of the Security Council and has a veto, you can't impose sanctions through the Security Council. So it has to all be states voluntarily participating in a sanctions regime. And lots of states have put in a huge variety of sanctions that have really made a significant difference in uh, in uh, uh, responding to the war. Um, among the sanctions, and this is just an example, so some of the sanctions you all have heard, of course, about the, the sanctions on oil imports and, and natural gas, and you know, those are things that we hear a lot about. But there's also been um, an effort to take advantage of the fact that there are some things that are hard for Russia to substitute for. So, you know, if you can't sell your oil and gas to Europe, maybe you can sell it to China and India, as we're going to see in a moment. But you might not be able to get sort of replacement airplane parts, um, which are really crucial to being able to continue to operate your airplanes over time. And so similar things with semiconductor chips. You know, there's efforts to try and provide um, sanctions on items that are not easily transferable. The downside of this is these are kind of slow burn sanctions. They don't have an impact right away. They tend to have an impact over time. Um, and then there are other kinds of sanctions which are symbolic but meaningful. Um, so for instance, Russia being excluded from uh, various sports events. Um, you may remember the Russian Federation was not allowed to compete as, as the Russian Federation at the last Olympics. There's talk now about even banning all Russian athletes. Um, so the last Olympics they were allowed to compete sort of independently. Um, there's talk now about even banning athletes themselves. Uh, certainly the Russian Federation won't be allowed to participate. You know, another symbolic but important move. Um, the Russian Federation was also excluded from the Council of Europe, which is an important European institution that allows states to take advantage of various political and economic collective um, projects that Russia has been a party of for, for quite a long time um, and remained a party of even though it required it to stay in the European Court of Human Rights, which kept holding against it over and over and over again. As you know, Russia cared about membership in the Council of Europe because it stayed despite the fact that all these negative decisions were being issued against it. Uh, and then the UN General Assembly also voted to kick Russia out of the Human Rights Council. So these are just a few, I mean, we could go on, but these are just a few of the examples of instances where Russia had consequences for, for its decision to wage an illegal war and was kicked out of these organizations. Then you might be saying, all oh, this is well and good, like these are sanctions, they hurt a little bit, you know, the economy took a little bit of a tank, but it's kind of ticking back up. Um, and yes, these sanctions are important, but they're kind of slow burn, they're not really gonna have a big impact. Um, uh, and, but there's more that has come as a result of the condemnation of these acts as illegal. And one of the key moves has been the decision to arm uh, Ukraine in response to the illegal war. Um, so the latest set of debates you all probably read about in the newspapers was a debate about providing tanks. These are the Leopard 2 tanks. Um, there are a whole series of kind of advanced tanks that are being talked about being provided to Ukraine. Ultimately, the decision was made to provide these tanks to Ukraine, which is a pretty unprecedented level of te technical support and you know high-level military armaments that generally um, isn't provided to partners. Um, 
that was just the tip of the iceberg. That's just the latest. I mean, you can see from this that there's been a huge amount of military, humanitarian, and financial aid with the United States leading the way in supporting Ukraine. And this graph goes on for quite a while. Um, this is just kind of tip of it. Um, lots of states providing significant amounts of aid to Ukraine to allow it to sustain itself in the face of this assault because, of course, it is much smaller. It's less well armed. Um, it's not, it doesn't have the resources that Russia does. And in order to be able to sustain the fight, it needs support. And it's being receiving unprecedented support uh, from its allies um, in return. And again, part of the argument here is that this support would not be forthcoming if it weren't for the fact that there was almost universal agreement that this war is illegal, right? That that, that matters, right? These General Assembly resolutions matter, not because the General Assembly resolution itself um, in the act does much, but because it allows all the rest of this stuff to happen, right? It allows economic sanctions to happen. It allows the arming to happen. It puts states in a position where they can take these actions to respond to the war. Um, this is just another way of looking at the support, you know, so whenever one puts up the kind of aggregate number, um, states that are smaller but are doing a lot um, sort of complain. So I wanted to put this up as well because you notice that a lot of the states here that are near the top of the list are states that are that are putting, you know, 10% of, uh, of, uh, of a huge percent of their aid, 1% of their GDP, huge percentage of their, of their EU aid. Um, into supporting Ukraine, um, which is a higher percentage than, than someplace like the United States is putting in, even though it's putting in as an aggregate number significantly more. And if you look at this list, it's a lot of states that, that undoubtedly see that, you know, if, if Russia succeeds in Ukraine, then they may very well be next. Right? These are states that are in the region who are fearful that, that if this norm prohibiting the use of force erodes, that, that they're the next victims of that. Okay, and then I want to get to prosecuting the kind of accountability for these crimes that are being committed because this is not only wrong, it's not only a violation of Article 2.4, but there's a, a bunch of international crimes being committed in the course of this war. Um, and so there have been a number of international accountability mechanisms that have kicked in. One of them you may have heard about is the International Criminal Court. This is the prosecutor, uh, Kareem Khan, Prosecutor General of the International Criminal Court who almost immediately after the war began announced that he was starting investigations of war crimes, uh, crimes against humanity, and potentially genocide taking place in Ukraine. And now, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over the war in Ukraine because Ukraine agreed to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court back in 2014 when Russia seized Crimea it filed a letter saying we agree to, to the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court going forward um, you know, indefinitely. So even though Ukraine's not a party, it's agreed to the jurisdiction of the court, and that's what gives the court jurisdiction over these crimes. So, and then a number of states have filed um, uh, support, um, uh, supported this investigation. Um, and so this is one of the most significant, probably the largest investigation the International Criminal Court has undertaken in its history and uh, really a kind of signal moment for the development of this international institution. Uh, now the ICC, as I mentioned, is investigating genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes. Um, it has one more crime in its statute, that is the crime of aggression. Now just to quickly sort of explain the difference between war crimes and crime of aggression, because they kind of sound the same, all right? So war crimes is crimes, uh, that is the crime of waging, effectively waging war in the wrong way. All right, so a war crime is a violation of the Geneva Conventions. Um, so, for instance, the Geneva Conventions say that you can shoot at military targets, but you can't intentionally shoot at civilians. Uh, so you can shoot at a military installation, but you can't intentionally target hospitals and schools. You can't intentionally shoot uh, and kill civilians. All right, so those are among the rules that, um, that govern war. There's a lot of them. The Geneva Conventions are hundreds of pages long, but but that gives you the idea of the kinds of rules. It's basically how you wage war once you've started the war. Um, and when you break those rules, that's a war crime. The crime of aggression is a little different. The crime of aggression is a crime of waging an illegal war in the first place. Right? It's a decision to wage the war that was in violation, in this case of Article 2.4. Right? And, 
Uh, and in the Rome Statute, it's defined as a manifest violation of Article 2.4 um, of the, of the UN, United Nations Charter, that is an illegal use of force. And it's in the Charter defined as a leadership crime. So you're not going to get sort of the ordinary soldier who participated in the illegal war, but you're going to get the people high up who are responsible for planning the war. Now, the problem for the ICC is that the way in which the, the statute um, has uh, been amended to include the crime of aggression, it does not allow um, the crime to be brought against states that are not party to the Rome Statute and the amendments that um, include, that define the crime of aggression. So this is a kind of loophole. Um, it's a kind of gap in the ICC's jurisdiction. Um, so that it, even though the crime of aggression is in the Rome Statute, that is the treaty that creates the International Criminal Court, um, it can't be prosecuted here. Um, so there's efforts underway to try and fill that gap, and I'll say a word about that. Um, so, um, so Ukraine has come out in support of, and this is an early um, statement of support, of a special tribunal to try the crime of aggression. It's, it's somewhat Nuremberg-like in a sense. You all, I'm sure, heard of Nuremberg after World War II. One of the central crimes that was prosecuted at Nuremberg was um, there they referred to as the crimes against peace. Um, this would be an effort to create a special tribunal whose whole purpose was, is to try the crime of aggression. Um, and this is a project I've been working on. I'm happy to answer more questions about it. But the, the version of it that I've been supportive of is the idea of, of the United Nations General Assembly, which has now voted several times in support of Ukraine and to condemn the Russian war, would vote uh, to recommend to the Secretary General that he negotiate an agreement with Ukraine to create a special tribunal. And that special tribunal would then be set up, probably located in The Hague, so that it could work closely with the International Criminal Court. And it would exclusively focus on prosecuting leaders most responsible for this war. And the reason I think this is important, um, and those who are working on this think this is important, is because without the crime of aggression, the, all the rest of the crimes wouldn't exist, right? If you hadn't waged this illegal war, you wouldn't have the war crimes. You wouldn't have the crimes against humanity. You wouldn't have the possible genocide being committed in Ukraine. And so to leave that unprosecuted seems to leave, important, leave something very important off the table. It's also the case that a lot of the harm that's being caused by this war is not accounted for by war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide, though those are incredibly important. Because all the soldiers who are dying in this war on both sides of the war, um, that's not a war crime. It's not a war crime to kill a soldier. Um, and so their lives are not accounted for in, these, in, these, in the crimes that can be prosecuted. And it's one reason that uh, creating a special tribunal is, in my view, important. Um, I wrote this piece, if you want to read a little bit more about my views on it, in Foreign Affairs uh, in, uh, about a month ago uh, called Russia's Crime and Punishment, which makes the case for creating a special tribunal and tries to explain how, how that would work. Um, even uh, Congress has come around, um, uh, so they haven't voted this through yet, but at least they're proposing um, to support, so this is a resolution that was proposed uh, just on January 31st, uh, to support the creation of a special tribunal for the punishment of the crime of aggression in Ukraine. Um, and a lot of states have begun to come out in support of this effort to provide accountability for the crime of aggression. Okay, so what are some challenges that have been revealed by this war? So I've mostly been telling a, a fairly happy story, but I think it's important to recognize that this has also really exposed some, some problems in the international legal order. One is that there's real questions about whether sanctions are actually working. Right, this is a piece from The Economist um, that uh, I think did a pretty nice assessment of kind of where we are about a year in, in terms of effectiveness of the sanctions. Also, a uh, piece in The New York Times today that, that um, tried to assess this a bit as well. It has been an extraordinarily robust response from uh, over 40 states that are sanctioning Russia for uh, its illegal war. Um, and there are ways in which it has had an impact on the ground in Russia. I mean, it's definitely initially tanked the economy, although the economy is beginning to come back. Um, it has um, closed Russia off from, from much of the global commerce. The banks can't, uh, can't cash tax. I mean, it's, it's a pretty substantial um, closing off of the Russian economy, at least from those countries that are participating in the sanctions. But not all states are participating in the sanctions. Um, and so while all these things are happening, you know, Russian firms are being barred from buying inputs, you know, from engines to chips, and in the long run, this intent is to impair Russia's ability to sort of 
engage in investment in future technology, it, it's still the case that it's not having the full impact that one might have hoped, right? It hasn't crashed the Russian economy in the way that one might have hoped. And part of the reason for that is that a number of states have kind of come in to fill the gap left by the sanctions. So this is just one example. India and China have been importing a lot more oil since the war began and to some degree making up some of the gap um, that has been established by the sanctions from states that are supporting Ukraine and that put in place sanctions. Um, and this has led people to wonder if we're witnessing a kind of splintering of the global economy. That we see states that are participating in the sanctions regime, that are closing off Ukraine, that are closing off states that are, that are sorry, closing off Russia, that are closing off states that are supporting Russia, that are not doing business with Russia. We've been seeing the ways in which Europe is trying to disentangle itself from its reliance on energy resources uh, in, uh, in Russia. But lots of states are not doing that, right? They're increasing their trade with Russia. They're increasing their buying of oil and gas from Russia. They're increasing the imports that, the inputs that are providing to Russia. So there's a real question as to whether what we're seeing is a kind of splintering of the global economy of states that are kind of joining together and participating in these sanctions and participating in the effort to respond to this using economic tools and states that are doing their best to make up the difference and therefore blunt the impact of those sanctions. Um, uh, you may remember Liz Truss, she's the one that did not last ahead of lettuce. Um, so she's come out in favor of an economic NATO. Um, uh, so this is just sort of more evidence that there's some, some thought that there could be increasingly this kind of disentangling of economies among states that disagree with one another and that has implications not just for the global economy, but potentially could have implications for international law and for peace more generally. Because at least the theory has long been that states that trade together are less likely to go to war with one another. When you have this disentangling of these economies, we don't really know what exactly follows from that. Another real challenge that we've seen is um, the West versus the rest. So this is just a kind of map of the states that voted in favor of that very first resolution of the General Assembly um, versus those that voted against. So you don't see a whole lot of red. You see Russia's a lot of red. But other than that, there's not a whole lot of red. There's not that many states that joined Russia in voting against the resolution. And there's a lot of states that voted, you know, 141 states that voted uh, in favor. But if you look at where the abstentions were, um, the abstentions are largely coming from states in Africa and in Asia. And I think this really is a challenge to all of us to think about why this is the case um, and why it is that countries in the global south, um, particularly uh, in Africa and in Asia, don't uh, see themselves as vested, invested in this project of the global order in the same way. Um, and you know, my hope is that this causes us to take a step back and think about how it is that we can create a global order that is seen as supportive and, and, and in the best interest of everyone. And I think if you make the case to states that really their best interests are to support, particularly in this case, the, the pro provision that prohibits the use of military force by neighbors against one another, these are states that, that will ben but benefit from that and that desperately need that. And it is in their best interest to maintain and support that central that central provision of international law, and it's and we ought to we ought to be understand trying to understand why this why this division has arisen and do more to make sure that the international order supports all states. We also you know I think while this is a great opportunity for the International Criminal Court and for international justice, it's also you know any opportunities are also an opportunity both to succeed and potentially to fail. Um, obviously, I hope very much that this is an opportunity for international justice to succeed. It's a, an extraordinary moment in history to see these cases proceeding in the International Criminal Court against a state that most would have thought would never been, be held to account, a P5 member with nuclear weapons. Like, that's the last state that you would expect to be held to account in international criminal justice. Um, but, you know, there are some signs that there might be some infighting, there might be resource constraints, Prosecutor Khan did come out against the special tribunal um, at a, a meeting in The Hague, the International Criminal Court Association of State Parties. 
Um, and, you know, there are questions as to why that's the case. Part of it is he'd rather have these cases all proceed in the ICC. Unfortunately, the conversion can't be prosecuted in the ICC without amending the Rome statute that creates the court. And most experts I talk to agree that that's a many years project and that that's not going to happen in time to be relevant for the war in Ukraine. So, you know, one concern is, of course, that these these institutions are up to the challenge, you know, and I hope that that's not true, but it's something that we have to be aware of. Um, and of course, we're on the eve of what is likely to be yet another, we're actually watching, beginning to unfold another offensive from Russia. Many more <coughs> conscripts being sent to the front, um, many more resources being devoted to the war. Um, and, you know, there's a real question as to whether Ukraine can, can survive this next onslaught. I mean, it really is extraordinary that they have fought as well as they have and they survived as long as they have um, and that they pushed back one of the great military powers of the world. Um, but, you know, that is not inevitable that they will continue to succeed. We certainly hope that they do, but we have to bear in mind that it's possible that they won't. Okay, so what's the impact on the global order so far? And then uh, this is just a reminder to get ready with your questions. One is we see this uh, remarkable revitalization of the General Assembly. So I mentioned before the rise of the, the sort of reactivation of the United for Peace resolution. And in the face of this paralysis of the Security Council, you've seen this move for the General Assembly to be acting much more aggressively and much more actively than it has um, in the past. And I think this is an extraordinary moment in the evolution of the UN. There's been efforts to try and sort of do formal amendments to the United Nations Charter, but those are very hard to get through because the Security Council can veto them. But this rise of the role of the General Assembly could potentially be a promising evolution of the UN to help be less reliant on the Security Council where these five members have this veto and have the General Assembly be able to play a more powerful and effective role in keeping international peace. We also see the revitalization of the ICC. I mean, all of a sudden, I wrote this op-ed in the Washington Post not that long ago, saying like, the U.S. finally sees the point of the International Criminal Court. You all may remember that uh, not that long ago, the U.S. was sanctioning uh, members of the International Criminal Court uh, because they began an investigation uh, for uh, potential war crimes by the United States in Afghanistan. And uh, then all of a sudden, you see people celebrating the International Criminal Court in the U.S., being, you know, enthusiastic about cooperating with the International Criminal Court. Um, and I think this is an opportunity for sort of shifting the relationship, not just between the United States and the International Criminal Court, but showing the role that it has to play and the value that it brings and the importance of having an institution like that. And so that, to, for me, is hopeful. We also have seen the revitalization and recommitment to the prohibition on war. Obviously, there's an extraordinary threat still underway from Russia um, it, with this war. Um, and, you know, the war could turn and this could go the other direction. But so far, the sort of collective response to this war, the extraordinary and consistent um, response of the global order to this war has been really unexpected and unprecedented. And I think it has helped us realize that this provision that we have kind of taken for granted, this idea that states can't just go to war and invade their neighbors, um, we, we kind of, that is fragile and that is valuable and it's something we need to act to protect. And so my hope is that in fact we're seeing, we're seeing a revitalization of commitment to that norm. But the long-term effects are still very much to be seen, right? So will the global economy fracture or will the forces kind of binding it together kind of hold it together? Will Ukraine's allies stay the course? We don't know how this next presidential election is going to go. There are certain people who are um, already in the, potentially in the race for a president and made it clear they don't want to continue to support Ukraine. That, given how important the US has been to Ukraine, that could be a really important shift in the war. Um, what will China do? China has, you may have seen on that map, it's been abstaining in all these votes um, in the General Assembly in a really interesting way but now apparently is toying with the idea of potentially selling weapons uh, to Russia. If that happens, that could too turn the tide of the war. You know, so is it gonna stay on the kind of sidelines and kind of try to stay out of the fight or is it going to kind of enter in one way or the other? And that remains to be seen. Does Putin have the support to maintain this fight? He, a lot of conscripts are dying. A lot of people are coming back in body bags. There's a political cost eventually to that. 
Um, so can he sustain support in the face of that? But at the same time, will he just overwhelm the resources of Ukraine? I mean, he's taking out so much of the infrastructure of the country, and at a certain point, being able to respond is extraordinarily difficult. And can these justice mechanisms live up to their promise? I mean, I certainly hope so, and I, I hope um, that this opportunity is not one that's going to be missed, but, but that's still something to be seen. And the answers to these questions are, are going to determine, in my view, the future of the international legal, legal order. But I want to end with this note, which is Russia clearly put the international legal order at risk when, he, when it uh, invaded Ukraine. When Putin decided to launch this war, he really, he, he did pose an extraordinary threat to the international legal order. Um, but what's going to determine the future is not that decision. Right? It's not that decision to invade. It's how we respond to it. And the response so far has been remarkably robust, um, but that, re that response has to be sustained in order for the global order to survive. And so the war that began as really what was the greatest threat to international legal order and still could be, um, could turn out to be a salvation if this global response remains, if the cohesiveness of the global order remains, and if we use it as an opportunity to revitalize these institutions uh, rather than see them decay. So with that, I look forward to your questions. I see there's a microphone up there. There's a hand over here. Sorry, this is, you're going you're gonna to be running all over. I'm sorry about that. Uh, hi, my question um, has to do with some of the economic sanctions that have been, been put in place. Uh, the EU on November 30th of last year uh, submitted a proposal about seizing the frozen Russian assets within the EU and using the profits of those sales to help um, Ukraine's rebuilding efforts. I guess my question was, um, what is the illegal exposure to the bloc if they do that, as well as to all of the banks within the bloc if um, the assets are seized from them? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's great that you asked that question. Um, there's a lot of uh, legal work going on right now on exactly those questions. Um, so in fact, I've been working with Piltig, the group that Michael um, uh, founded, uh, the Public Interest Law, um, uh, law Firm, that is working on this question of reparations. And among the questions we're deep in the weeds of is exactly what you asked. And to be honest, we don't yet know the answer. Um, is, it, is, it, is the honest answer. So the challenge is there's a lot of assets that have been seized, central bank assets that have been seized, and also oligarch assets that have been seized. But the legal challenge is can you continue to hold them if the war ends? And second, can you convert those assets and use them for, um, to, to pay for, the ver for compensation for the, for the harm that's being done uh, to Ukraine? And if so, how do you do that? Um, and that, that conversion piece is the legally tricky part. And in particular, um, one of the biggest challenges is conversion of sovereign assets. Um, so most of the money is in these central bank assets, about 10 times as much money is in these central bank assets as is in oligarch assets. So we all love to see these, you know, these vessels being seized, the yachts being seized, the apartments being seized, right? Those are very like flashy, but that's not where the real money is. The real money is in the central bank assets. And that's the hardest to get because there's sovereign immunity um, provisions that potentially could make that extraordinarily difficult. So the EU is certainly interested in doing that. Canada also has passed a law that's similar to that. We're going to be seeing this unfold, and a lot of lawyers, um, you know, I'm working with the team at Pilpig, I'm working with a team of my students at the law school. Um, we're trying to find the answers and trying to find creative answers. And this is just part of where... This is an opportunity for lawyers to be trying to think about how do we work within the existing legal, legal constraints to find ways to solve problems. Because these are problems we haven't really had to face before. We've never had an instance where we've tried to have a reparations mechanism where we didn't have the Security Council um, uh, willing to vote for it. So the last big one that, that looked anything like what's being contemplated here is the reparations mechanism at the end of the Iraq-Kuwait War, where there was a big reparations mechanism set up. But that was done by the Security Council. And again, Security Council is, is not going to act here because uh, we have uh, Russia um, able to veto those, uh, those uh, actions. So, so we have to get creative, um, and we're all trying. All right, so we got to uh, – well, we can – I can also hand over my microphone. So why don't I hand over my microphone? Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, I have a, also a question kind of about sanctions. I, I don't know if this is a question that there's a great answer to, so I'm going to try to put it in context of two things that you said. One um, is the questionable effectiveness of sanctions, uh, especially I'm curious about if you have anything to say about, about SWIFT. And then the second thing is you talked about um, the Global South's abstention from, um, from, from the vote, from support, from active support for this cause in Ukraine. So how do we balance in that context? How do we balance our, I think, legitimate universal interest in preventing states from engaging in acts of war and aggression with the effects of sanctions on regular people? I mean, this is the this is the question when it comes to sanctions, right? Uh, and what what is important to recognize is that this tool of economic sanctions is relatively new. Um, so up until um, war was outlawed, economic sanctions were actually equivalent to declaring war against another state. And so we've only had about seventy years to kind of figure out this economic sanctions thing. Um, and so this tool has been evolving in lots of really interesting ways, and um, we're constantly figuring out new ways to solve problems. So on the problem of how do we affect, how do we prevent sanctions from affecting ordinary people, we can't prevent it altogether. But some of the innovations that we've seen is much more targeted sanctions, so sanctions of particular individuals, which is both a technical um, innovation, the ability to actually locate particular individuals who are responsible for the war and to target their assets, prevent them from traveling. You know, so this was used um, in sanctions against Iran, and this is being used against sanctions against Russia, the particular oligarchs and various members of government within Russia that have been that have been uh, targeted. Also, this is another reason that a lot of the sanctions are these kind of slow burn sanctions, which are really meant to kind of make it difficult for businesses to operate in Russia um, and not meant to sort of drive up costs of things that ordinary people depend on. Um, so the early sanctions, which are very kind of broad-based sanctions and have the tendency of driving up food prices, driving up medical prices, there's obviously humanitarian exceptions to all of the, all of the sanctions that are put in place. Um, now, which was not always true when sanctions were initially put in place. So this is part of the innovative um, techniques. Also the question around SWIFT, I mean, this is what they have been trying to do, and by they I mean, you know, people at US Treasury, people around the world who are trying to think about how to make sanctions more effective, is exactly how to thread this needle that you've put on the table, which is how do you make it effective, but how do you not, you know, hurt ordinary people in ways that are, that are, that are, you know, I mean, so after the sanctions against Iraq are believed to have really, like, pushed child mortality rates in Iraq through the roof. Um, and that's a cautionary lesson about the dangers of sanctions, and we don't want to do that. But at the same time, we do want to put pressure on the government. So how do you put pressure on the government in the right ways? Using these kinds of bank tools, I mean, so the innovation of secondary sanctions against um, Iran is another big innovation that kind of we sort of stumbled into, and what that is, is basically secondary sanctions means um, that was used to kind of push um, Iran to the negotiating table to negotiate the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, known as the Iran nuclear deal, was um, basically saying you have to choose, are you going to do business with U.S. banks or with Iranian banks? Like, you can't do both. Um, uh, and, you know, so if you're going to do business in Iran, you can't do business with, uh, with U.S. banks. And because the dollar is the reserve currency of choice. That basically meant everybody was closing off uh, Iran from trade. Now, in some ways, that's almost too powerful of a tool because it's extraordinary um, in, in the effectiveness that it has. And it also, ha using those tools, you can't do that over and over again. Eventually, somebody's going to go looking for a different reserve currency than the dollar. So I think Treasury is also aware of the fact that you don't want to be so aggressive in the use of these kinds of tools that you blow what is in some ways a kind of source of amazing, amazing US power. So these are questions that are like in the, like this is exactly what people are trying to figure out, right? I mean, that's, that's what's so interesting about this field right now is that there's so much innovation happening. You know, if you go work at Treasury, you go talk to people at Treasury and the State Department, the Commerce Department, like these are exactly the things they're trying to so solve. And they've made huge innovations in the last 10, 20 years, and I think they're going to continue to, to innovate around this, both how to make them more effective, and then also how to make them more effective on the people who matter, right? 
how do you, how do you, because in a country like Russia, it's not clear that harming ordinary people is really going to make a, a difference in terms of the outcome, but har harming the oligarchs and freezing their assets and making it more difficult for them to do business might. Um, so that's part of the, the logic behind some of this innovation. We call it in our book Out Outcasting 2.0, so trying to talk about the innovation around sanctions. Great, what else? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Professor <laughs> Hathaway. Uh, I hope my question will not relate to national secret. Uh, my question is, uh, what, in your opinion, what is the probability that uh, Russia will be disintegrated again, like uh, Soviet Union? And uh, if the Russia really do disintegrate it, so what is uh, possible for the United Nations uh, a Security Council be reformed? That's my question. Thank you. Yeah, that's such an interesting question. Um, so I don't claim to be a Russia expert. Um, uh, and Russia experts are, are incredibly important to understanding the answer to these kinds of questions. I certainly have, have um, seen uh, uh, some speculation about that possibility. I think it's probably relatively unlikely. Um, I mean, unless something pretty radical changes in Russia in the short term, the kind of true disintegration of Russia, um, which is, of course, a, like a massive multi-ethnic state, um, seems unlikely. Though I will say that um, it is striking that a lot of the conscripts are apparently coming from regions of Russia that tend to be poorer, ethnic minority regions of Russia. And at a certain point, one has to imagine that those regions are not um, are are going to resist, um, and that could that could spark some of the kinds of, of ideas that you're suggesting. But I, I think that truthfully, that's highly unlikely in the short term, at least. At least that's my sense. Um, as to the Security Council seat, um, Ukraine has raised a couple questions. Has occasionally raised questions as to whether they can challenge the Security Council seat of, of Russia because when the Soviet Union disintegrated, Russia was the one that 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 took over the Security Council seat. Because of course, originally when it was created, there was it was the Soviet Union, not 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 Russia. That was the the UN member. Although, just a short aside, Stalin wanted to have all the republics have their own seats in the UN um, and tried to negotiate for that. Um, and got negotiated down to three. Um, uh, so Russia was one of them, Ukraine and Belarus um, were the other two, interestingly. Um, and that was sort of one of the things that Roosevelt and, and Churchill bargained off uh, for the veto, because the P5 veto was something actually Churchill and Roosevelt resisted. And Stalin basically said, this is, this is like not negotiable. This is essential. We're not going to join without the, without the veto. And so, you know, a little bit of history is helpful to understand. They didn't sort of stumble into it. They didn't just make a mistake. I mean, it was, it was you know, a decision that they made. And I think if, if there was disintegration of Russia, there's a whole law around succession of states that would determine what unit would take over that seat. I don't think the idea of, like, it loses it altogether seems very likely, much as Ukraine would like uh, to suggest otherwise. Looks like we're coming to the end of our time. Yes. So, let me ask everybody to, once again, give a, a big round of applause. And thank you all for coming here. This has just been a great turnout, great questions, and what a wonderful presentation.